thank you all for joining us. I'm Judith Salter, your librarian and host. I'll be on hand to answer questions during the webinar. We've got another great program for you. Welcome to the EBM EBFM seminar series. Each month we feature a new speaker and a topic related to ecosystem-based fisheries management and ecosystem-based management. Our March 2018 speaker is Sean Lucy from NOAA's Northeast Fishery Science Center. Sean's presentation is titled, Modeling the Food Web, the Mass Balance Approach at the NEFSC. Sean will discuss the general mass balance approach and how it has been applied at the Northeast Fishery Science Center. Sean Lucy is a fisheries biologist at NOAA's Northeast Fishery Science Center. He works for the Ecosystem Dynamics and Assessment Branch in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. He serves on several international, national, and regional ecosystem working groups. Please join me in welcoming Sean Lucy. Thank you. Thanks uh, for having me. It's been an interesting few days here in the Northeast. We just uh, survived our third nor'easter in the, in the last two weeks. My wife is actually at home without power right now and isn't all that happy that I'm here uh, talking to you all, but I am glad to be at work and where it's nice and warm. So I am going to uh, give a you know some quick brief overview of what uh, ecosystem modeling is and then sort of narrow that down into the mass balance approach and then how that's been applied here at the Northeast Fishery Science Center uh, in the past and how we plan on continuing that work into the, into the near future. Uh, so let me just start by explaining what the role of ecosystem models are. Uh, they're really to provide context and understanding for uh, marine managers to, in which to make their decisions. So we really view it as providing mostly strategic advice, uh, although you can get some limited tactical advice out of these ecosystem uh, modeling exercises. Uh, and, and as such, they're really meant to complement and not replace single species models. So you're always going to need to have uh, the more, more um, dedicated single species model there to provide your tactical advice. Uh, there's a wide range of ecosystem models, uh, and they can start from basic uh, extensions of single species assessment models. So where you're just adding on one or two extra interactions, whether that be with a prey species or, or with climate or something of that nature onto existing uh, single species models. Uh, then you can, the next two are sort of uh, fla different flavors of the same thing, but you can have a dynamic uh, system model, which is really a representation of bottom-up processes as well as top-down processes. And so you can think of those as your individual base models or, or some of your uh, NPZ models, your nutrient uh, phytoplankton, zooplankton type models. Um, then you also look at minimal realistic models. And these are where you're taking a representation of a limited number of species that have important interactions together. So this is your uh, multi-species VPA analysis uh, and those types of models. And then, of course, finally, you can look at whole ecosystem models where you're trying to uh, model pretty much all the different dynamics that are going on in the system. So you're starting at your lower trophic levels and working your way all the way up through the upper trophic levels and even including, uh, you know, fisheries interactions and other interactions if, if you wanted to. And those, of course, would be your Atlantis models and your Ecopath ecosystem models. And, of course, which type of that model, which type of model you choose uh, is really uh, dependent on what type of questions you want answered. Uh, so no one model sort of does everything for everyone. Uh, so if we just start at this, uh, this flow chart here, you can start at the beginning, you know, do you want to have biological interactions? Uh, is there going to be predator-prey feedback? Uh, are you going to handle environmental and lower trophic levels? You want to then go add age structure or size structure, and of course spatial structure. And what you're going to see, I don't know if you guys can see my pointer here, hopefully, uh, your mass balance, your ecopath ecosystem model sort of fall uh, on this part of the flow diagram here, um, where you don't necessarily have spatial structure, uh, but you can handle some size structure and, of course, incorporate the lower trophic levels in, uh, in the environment. Um, there is a module of EWE that does allow you to do the spatial structure, and that is the ecospace here, but uh, I won't really touch on that in the rest of this uh, 
rest of this uh, presentation. And of course, uh, once you've sort of stepped through that, you can also get an idea of how many species or components are going to be in your model. And this sort of goes to the complexity of the model, how much uh, data is going to be required. Uh, and so you have on, you know, on, the, on the right side here your extended single species assessment models or your minimal or realistic models. And those are incorporating you know, two, three, maybe five species at the most. Uh, and then, of course, as you work your way up, you know, through the, some of these dynamic system models, you know, you might have 10 to 15 species. And then, at the whole ecosystem level, your ecopath models and your Atlantis models, you're going to be looking, you know, 20, 30 or more species in those models. Um, and the same thing goes on what part of the system you really want to take a look at. So, if you wanted to just focus in on some of the upper trophic levels, uh, so this is where you would find your minimal realistic models, your extended single species models, where you might look at, you know, one or two trophic levels uh, in interactions between them. Uh, then, of course, you might have those NPZ type models uh, operating there on the bottom where they're just looking at the lower trophic levels, maybe pulling in a little bit of the fish species up above it. And then ultimately those ecopath models or Atlantis models, which are encompassing the whole range of the trophic uh, uh, levels. And of course, you can also model some external forcing on that entire system uh, in a number of these different models. So that's uh, a, a real general overview of ecosystem modeling and the different types and flavors that might be out there. What I'll be talking about for the, um, the remainder of this talk, of course, is uh, the mass balance approach, and really what that is, uh, the most popular version is the ecopath of ecosim. Uh, and so ecopath is is really uh, a, a NOAA-grown uh, model. So it was uh, originally developed by Jeff Polovina out in the French frigate, frigate Shoals, uh, doing um, work in trying to see the trophic flows uh, through the reef systems out there. Uh, in the in the early 80s, and then of course it was uh, later refined by uh, Dan Pauly and, and Philly Christensen um, up at UBC uh, in the early 90s. They then took the ecopath part of it, the sort of static snapshot, and and, and expanded that to include a dynamic simulation. Uh, Carl Walters and Philly and Dan Daniel Pauly and all of them were involved in that in uh, the late 90s and. As I sort of alluded to, they've also created a, a spatially dynamic simulation uh, called EcoSpace. Uh, and, and once again, that's, that's not something I'm really going to touch on, on here. Um, some highlights. Uh, it's a, uh, EcoPath of EcoSim is a, is a widely popular modeling uh, uh, platform. So there's over 400 publications uh, you know, that have come out since um, since the, the mid 80s when, when the Ecopath was first released. Uh, it was noted as one of the top 10 scientific breakthroughs by NOAA during their 200th anniversary a few years back. Um, and now it's a little bit dated, but they did have a 30th anniversary international symposium in Barcelona, Spain, where they had uh, presenters from all over the, the world really uh, showing the, the latest and greatest stuff that they've been doing with Ecopath and Ecosim. Uh, we're now approaching 35 years, uh, so I, I assume they might have another anniversary symposium soon. But despite all of this um, proliferation of publications and, and use and, and acknowledgement of how good a system it is, it, it is used very sparingly in management. Uh, and so, you know, that's something we hope to to uh, change here going forward. Um, and that could be because of some of the best uses of the system. So uh, Ecopath itself uh, is really good at identifying, quantifying the major energy flows in the ecosystem. Uh, and this uh, allows you to describe the ecosystem resources and their interactions between the different components of the system. Uh, and then when you sort of take it from Ecopath and you make it dynamic with the Ecosim, you can start evaluating the ecosystem effects of fishing uh, or environmental changes, or yeah, environmental changes on the system, and then there's a little bit of built in to explore management policy options, uh, something that we're actually hoping to expand upon in the near future. <laughs>
<clears throat> so, like I said, um, Ecopath is uh, a snapshot of the ecosystem state. Uh, at the heart of it is really a trophic model, so a trophic food web, uh, which we'll see. And it's considered to be uh, mass balance, and uh, that doesn't necessarily mean steady state. So uh, what it means is what uh, there needs to be a, a pathway for all of the energy, right? So sort of your first laws of thermodynamics, you can't you know, spontaneously create or destroy energy within the system. So you have to account for all of it everywhere. Uh, so one of the sort of common misconceptions is that it, it needs to be at equilibrium then for, for you to not have, uh, you know, this, this spontaneous creation or destruction of energy. But there are terms in the, in the equations that allow you to, to put things on a trajectory. So you can have uh, a biomass accumulation term, which could show the biomass declining or, or increasing. And you can also have immigration terms, which would allow biomass to leave or enter into the system. Uh, so that allows you to not be at that equilibrium. Uh, but it is time invariant, right? So it's just one point in time. Uh, and then if you wanted to go forward, then you'd have to push it into ecosim. So if you were to just uh, decide to create your own ecopath model, there's a few general things that you'd want to keep in mind uh, when you're defining your boxes or your structure of your model. Uh, and these are, you know, of course, pretty similar to what you would think about when you were deciding to use Ecopath uh, as, your, as your operating model is uh, what questions are you asking? So do you need to have the functionality of an entire ecosystem? Uh, and what parts of that ecosystem uh, do you need to have really fully fleshed out or which ones can you have a little bit more aggregated um, as you move forward? Um, when, if you do aggregate uh, species together, you really want to use uh, uh, functional ecological groupings with niche overlap rather than just a straight taxonomic um, uh, criteria to aggregate. And that being that you want to have, have things in, a, in an aggregation that are experiencing the same levels of production, that are experiencing the same levels of exploitation, that are eating more or less the same uh, same stuff out of the system. Uh, so it's important to, to aggregate that way rather than straight taxonomy. Uh, it's not wise to leave any group out of your model just because you don't think the data is there. Uh, believe it or not, the way these models are set up, you can uh, kind of, for better, lack of a better word, sort of guess uh, what, what the biomass would be or let the model figure out what the biomass should be. Uh, rather, um, by by specifying what's called an ecotrophic efficiency, which I'll, I'll get to in a little bit. But so it allows you to to make sure that you have the whole trophic structure in your model, uh, and that includes not even top level um, predators, which sometimes uh, data is lacking on, but also some of the lower trophic levels. So you know you want to make sure that you include things like bacteria, uh, because the, the microbial loop can be uh, very important on some of these systems uh, moving forward. But just a, a you know word of caution is to be careful when you, if you use bacteria because that can sort of uh, grow exponentially and get out of hand quickly. Um, and it's just a bit of housekeeping is that you have to have at least one detrital group in the in your systems. So that way, you know things that die go somewhere uh, and and can be accounted for. Once again, you know not being able to create or destroy energy in the system. <clears throat> just a few more things in those boxes, uh, sort of what I just said, but you want to make sure that you include all your top predators, uh, not just uh, what you're, you're interested in. So like if you're in the Northeast and you're interested in ground fish, you wouldn't want to build a model that just stopped at cod. You'd want to, you know, include, you know, seals and, the, and your sharks and your highly migratory species and everything else that are, are bringing energy into the system and moving energy around in the system as well. Uh, you can uh, consider age-specific stanzas. Uh, it's similar to how you would want to group um, your aggregations. You want to uh, set up your stanzas so that way they're really capturing large ontogenetic shifts in either the diet or the exploitation patterns of the species. Um, 
EcoPath with EcoSim isn't necessarily an age or size structured model, uh, but it, it, ha it can include some of those dynamics uh, as it moves forward. Uh, and so in, for EcoPath itself, not really that big a deal to have these stanzas separated out, uh, but if you do want to make it go dynamic in EcoSim, then you'd want to make sure that you have these stanzas um, parameterized right. And, and basically, biomass would grow from one stanza to the next uh, rather than, uh, once again, just being spontaneously created. <clears throat> EcoPath models are typically one, um, typically use an average value for the year, so it, you, you really can't include seasonal changes in EcoPath models. That's not to say that you couldn't build a fall model and a spring model and, and you could get a lot of different information out of doing that and building the two models and seeing how energy flow is different in the two seasons. Um, but it's very hard <clears throat> even to get an eco-sim, uh, a dynamic situation to flow seasonally. And so if you're, if you're building multiple ecopath models, you might want to note large scale changes in the ecosystem structure and try and build one maybe before a major event and then one after a major event. And the same thing is if you were looking at it seasonally, you could then see how the energy flow has changed in those two uh, snapshots in time. When you get down to it, um, the ecopath model is really based on two master equations. So there's an equation for production, which means um, everything that so these two are, are linked. So you have consumption that goes into production. So let me start at the bottom, I guess. The consumption is equal to your production plus any unassimilated food plus respiration. So everything they eat isn't going to necessarily go into production. They're going to lose some of it that they can't digest. And then obviously swimming around uh, uses energy, and so some of that is lost. Uh, and then what is left over goes to production, which then – uh, goes into predation, so what of what is being eaten, uh, what is being removed by the fisheries, what the biomass accumulation, so here's where your population can grow or shrink, uh, net migration, once again, if it's moving in or out of the system, and then sort of a, a catch-all other mortality term uh, for things that aren't being accounted for in the model. And so that is really your mass balance, is balancing this consumption pie with this production pie. And so let me just show you like a really simple food web. So if you take this overly simplistic food web where you have, you know, a forage fish, a piscivore, a marine mammal, and a fisherman. And so each one of these is going to consume stuff while they're out there. Uh, a portion of it is going to get drop off and it's going to go to detritus. That's your unassimilated food. And then your respiration is just going to burn off. And then the rest of this pie goes into your production. But then the way you really balance the whole system out is then, you know, this production wheel is supplying the consumption for, for this predator and this predator. This uh, production wheel is, of course, providing some of the consumption for this predator. And then ultimately you also have some of that production being lost to your fishery. And so you can see how you can build this out and make this uh, uh, quite complex. But in the end, it's really just solving um, a, a series of linear equations. So in order to build one of these models, there's is really just uh, a few data uh, requirements. Uh, lots of this can be obtained empirically, but of course, uh, some of it might need to get through the literature. Um, you don't necessarily need each one of these for every box, as a matter of fact, uh, you should let the system uh, solve for, for one or more of these. Uh, so you would need your biomass in uh, density, so your tons per kilometer squared, your production to biomass and consumption to biomass rates, this ecotrophic efficiency, and basically what that is is a proportion of the consumption that is not accounted for in the model. Um, so if you have production that's not being eaten anywhere, uh, it has to go somewhere, so it, it, it puts it into sort of this catch-all ecotrophic efficiency um, number. 
then of course you need your diet composition, uh, which is something you have to uh, provide it. You can't solve for diet composition. Uh, and then also catch, which is another thing that you'd have to provide it. It can't solve for catch, right? And so if you take that, you know, primary, this, uh, the production master equation and you rearrange it, and so you end up with your biomass and your production to biomass and your, your eco ecotrophic efficiency all on the left-hand side, then you can do some uh, matrix algebra here and basically solve for... Uh, your unknowns here, your vector of X would be your unknown biomass or your unknown ecotrophic efficiency um, uh, based on all of the removals and stuff that you have going on. <clears throat> so that is EcoPath. EcoSim uh, uses the mass balance EcoPath for its initial state but it is a time dynamic simulation. So from that point on, it can diverge uh, quite uh, quite rapidly from that uh, initial state, depending on how you parameterize it. Uh, it utilizes something called foraging arena theory, which I'll go over in a little bit. Uh, it includes both biomass and size structure dynamics, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, it also has some variable speed splitting, so you can have some fast equilibrium for groups that would turn over faster than an annual time step, uh, which is what the model is running on. And those would be for your, you know, your lower trophic level things, so your phytoplankton and your zooplankton. And so for biomass dynamics, basically you're just uh, turning your series of linear equations into a series of coupled differential equations. Uh, and so now you have your change in biomass over time as your growth efficiency times your consumption minus uh, your predation, minus your other mortality, minus your fissures removal, and uh, obviously you can tack on other terms for the migration and biomass accumulation as well. Um, so one of the <clears throat> things that Carl Walters noticed when they were first putting this together uh, is that you know, your classical food web models assumed your mass action principles. So if you go back and you think about your sort of general chemistry classes, your mass action principle would be that if you took element A and element B and mixed them into a solution, they would interact at, you know, whatever the interaction coefficient was and produce, you know, your other, your, uh, your compound. Uh, and so I, you would, the way a lot of things, the old models were parameterized, that's how it would work is you sort of, you'd have your predators and your prey and they would interact uh, and you would get your consumption that way. This seems to work for when you have few weak trophic interactions, uh, but when you apply it to a whole ecosystem, uh, things tend to go a little, little, little off kilter. So you end up with a lot of strong top-down controls. Uh, you also get these predictions of dynamic instability. So sort of your sort of your 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 links in your hair kind of uh, lock of terror instabil instabilities. Uh, you get unstable community structure, so you lose a lot of biodiversity as things are sort of uh, sort of fed upon and, and fed down. Um, and so obviously that's not what we're seeing when, when we sample the, the environment. And so <clears throat> what Carl Walters and others did was, was think about it more in a foraging arena type of um, scenario. So if you take this as being your generic ecosystem with you know, your P's being your, you know, lower level phytoplankton, maybe your Z's being zooplankton, and your PR's being these predators on the zooplankton. Uh, eventually, uh, prey gets smart enough and say, all right, I don't want to be next to the predators. I want to, you know, figure out a way to minimize my chance of predation. So they might go and occupy, you know, shallower water habitat that the predator can't uh, access. And of course, over time, the, the, prey, the, the prey of those zooplankton um, I said, well, yeah, let's not be there either. Uh, I'd rather get away from my predator now. And what ends up happening is you create what's called a foraging arena, this sort of spatial overlap, uh, you know, in either, you know, time or space where you have the predator and the prey in the same location. And, you know, you might have multiple uh, of these arenas throughout your ecosystem. So it's maybe not one specific area, but there's, you know, 
many, many of these multi, uh, uh, micro uh, foraging arenas that are occurring. And you know, to further explain what we see in nature is eventually a predator might get smart and say, well, you know what, it's great that I'm doing okay here in this foraging arena, but you know, if I go into this foraging arena, I do much better. So here's where you have your sort of niche adaptations uh, and, and sort of your specialization uh, and, and an increase in biodiversity. And what this explains is what we see in nature, right? So you, you see a high proportion of empty stomachs when you're out in the field. Uh, you see high search efficiencies. There's widespread complex trophic ontogeny, so lots of things are eating different ways and in, in different places. Uh, there's lack of a proportional dependence on, mort on uh, mortality, on predator abundance. Uh, there seems to be a conservation of total mortality. We see a lot of uh, ecosystems that have bottom-up controls rather than these strong top-down controls. Uh, high sensitivity of top predators to fishing, uh, and of course, high, higher biodiversity than you would expect with just classic mass, mass action principles. So this is basically what I just said in mathematical form. So you end up having um, a, a pool of unavailable prey and a pool of available prey, and they're exchanging off almost instantaneously by this vulnerability term. Uh, and then, of course, you have this available prey pool and this predator pool that are acting exactly as you would imagine with your mass action principle where, you know, the consumption is uh, based on the amount of prey and the amount of predators and some, you know, interaction coefficient. So you still get that part of, you know, your classical uh, food web uh, theory, uh, but now with this interaction in and out of the available and unavailable prey. And of course, you can layer on a bunch of other stuff to this equation and, and build more realism into your model the more complicated you want it to get, such as handling time and, and foraging adjustment time when things aren't going well. Um, but it's important to remember uh, as you do these things that it's difficult to represent your, your uh, fully represent natural dynamics. Uh, one of the things that you should strive to do when you're building one of these models is really be able to re reproduce the correct direction and order of magnitude of perturbations. So if you see something in nature, you should at least be able to ballpark get about where it is. Uh, you know, there's always these, you know, secondary and tertiary feedback loops that we might not be able to capture uh, in, in our models. Uh, and so the, the value of the predicted outcomes are really relative to each other, especially those when we start impacting policy choices. So the absolute values of any of these simulations aren't as important as the relative uh, outcomes. So that's uh, a general overview of what mass balance is. Um, now I can uh, talk a little bit about how it's been applied here at the Northeast Fishery Science Center. Uh, and then going, going forward in time. So here is the Northeast Shelf. Uh, we sample uh, from Cape Hatteras all the way up into the Gulf of Maine. I am here with no power in Woods Hole uh, on Cape Cod. Uh, and so, you know, there's a, a number of different ways to sort of slice up the ocean. Uh, this is a more traditional way of doing it. I'll, I'll talk about a newer way we're doing a little bit later. Uh, but one thing that always sort of stands out is this region here, which is George's Bank. Uh, so this is a very highly productive uh, fishing ground. Uh, going back to the early 1800s, uh, a lot of the hydrographic um, character, excuse me, characteristics of the of the shelf um, or of the bank rather uh, lead to sort of a retention of of uh, um, primary production. Um, so it's you have this deep basin in the Gulf of Maine. You have this shallow marine plateau, George's Bank. Then you have upwelling coming off the side, and you know flow from the Labrador Current and the Gulf Stream. Uh, anyway, so we have uh, a number of people have looked at George's Bank and sort of thought about mass balance, or at least some predecessor of mass balance, if you'd like, uh, going all the way back to the 40s uh, that was refined in the 80s uh, by Cohen and, and, and Sissenwine, um, and then Jason Link and others in the early uh, 2000s or mid, 
mid 2000s rather, uh, developed a series of ecopath models for this region, um, which of course were not just Georgia's bank, they were actually shelf wide. So they developed these four regions of the mid Atlantic, the southern New England, they were calling it Georgia's bank in the Gulf of Maine. And then work that I am currently working on now, which will also be shelf wide, uh, but not quite use these, uh, these eco regions, uh, but we'll get to that. Um, so the, one of the first studies uh, by Clark in 1946, this is a, obviously a relatively simple representation of the system uh, where you only had four nodes uh, and it was more of a NPZ style model where you had you know, your nutrients coming in, you know, feeding your diatoms, which would then feed your zooplankton and your benthos, which then in turn, of course, would go up to your fish production and influence the amount of uh, fish that could be landed. Um, that was uh, later expanded uh, by Cohen et al. in 1982. Uh, and here, the big thing is they're including the microbial loop. So now you have some detritus and bacteria, which are having recycled production going into the, the benthos and then sort of the demersal pathway where you have your more traditional um, uh, new production going from primary production to zooplankton up to the pelagic food web. Um, Sisson Wine et al. In, in 1984 then also added in uh, the importance of juvenile fish uh, into this system. They're not represented in this figure, but uh, you can see that we're you know slowly stepping up our complexity where we you know, went from four nodes to nine modes to 10, mo to 10 nodes with Sisson Wine. Uh, and then Jason Link et al. in 2006 then came out uh, as part of their energy modeling and analysis exercise, uh, a, a more detailed model, this one having 31 nodes. But if you take a close look at this model, we're still looking at you know a, a, a fairly coarse aggregation of species. So you still are looking at you know um, demersal pisivores, demersal benthivores, uh, you know, macrobenthos, small pelagics, commercials. So there's still, you know, multiple species lumped together here. Uh, but for characterizing, you know, the energy flow through the system and what this was designed for, uh, it was, they, they were great models uh, to have. And so I know, I think part of this gets cut off when you guys are viewing it. Uh, the, the numbers themselves in this table aren't really that important. Uh, but this is just some results from the Emax model on George's Bank. Uh, and so one of the things that we see is that this throughput number here, that uh, a lot of the energy, of course, is, is as you expect, coming through the phytoplankton uh, and, and going up and, of course, dissipating as you go higher. Uh, but there's also a, a fair amount of throughput um, through the bacteria and the microzooplankton. Uh, showing, just really highlighting the importance of that microbial loop and that recycled production, especially as it moves up through the benthos. Um, we also see this, uh, you know, fairly low eutrophic efficiency number. So one of the things that I, I failed to mention early on is your eutrophic efficiency is sort of bounded by one, right? So you can't have um, more than 100% of your production explained in your model. Uh, and that's sort of the way most people balance their ecopath models, is making sure that everything is less than one. Uh, but you can also sort of have the reverse problem where maybe you're not accounting for enough of the production uh, in the model. So <clears throat> if you are really uh, confident in what your biomass uh, estimates are and your production to biomass estimates, things like that, and you come up with an eutrophic number that is you know, below 0.8 really, um, it, there's a few things it's saying. One is that either the production is not being utilized in the system, uh, so, it's, so it's just sort of wasted production. Um, or uh, it's saying that there's mortality that's not captured in the model. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, you would expect to see that for things like whales and, um, and highly migratory species that you wouldn't, you don't have the predict predators in the system. Uh, but it's just something that you uh, you really want to take a look at. If you have low eutrophic efficiency numbers, you could 
be missing where some of that production is going. It could be leaving the system, migrating out of the system. Uh, so all these other things you want to take into account. These last couple columns uh, are a little bit more difficult to explain, but basically what they are are network metrics that explain how specialized and efficient a system is. Um, and so unfortunately it's the numbers that are cut off, but they're not really that important. Um, overhead is, is the difference between that capacity and the ascendancy. And so George's Bank had an overhead of about 21% of capacity, which this is consistent with a resilient system. Uh, so it could handle these major perturbations that we've seen in the, in the history of George's Bank. If, uh, and so Jason and others actually took a look at, at all of these uh, different uh, model, enter, uh, mass balance applications and did a uh, comparison across time. Um, so I already mentioned that you see this in, increase in complexity of the models over time. Uh, going from the four nodes to over 30 nodes. Uh, despite that, you still see similar levels of primary production. So this, uh, this first bar right here. Um, and, you know, of course, the one thing that might stand out in this figure is this high level of zooplankton production in the Emacs work. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the limiting sample of some earlier, uh, of the earlier studies. So in 46, there was very limited zooplankton sampling. Uh, and then the discrepancy with the 80s uh, and the, the more current version was an understanding of the production dynamics. So the numbers they used for the production to biomass were much lower for the zooplankton uh, based on studies uh, from Europe uh, than what we know now, which is leading to the discrepancy. Um, then if you take a look at the removals, so the fisheries removals, uh, even though these are, of course, from uh, much different uh, time periods, uh, you do see, you know, removals that are at least within a half an order of magnitude of each other, which is pretty consistent. Uh, you know, the 80s work, of course, are based on simulation or based on studies from 73 to 75, where you would have had uh, many of the ground fish uh, stocks collapsing on George's Bank. And so uh, the production estimates uh, were sort of reversed what we saw with the zooplankton. You see they were probably overly productive estimates uh, in the 80s, the work done in the 80s. But the take home message is that George's Bank is highly productive, uh, that there is a notable influence of primary producers indicative of that strong bottom-up forcing. Uh, and there is a high level of interconnectedness uh, within the food web, which indicates a very resilient system. But what about the rest of the shelf? So uh, uh, Jason and them looked at uh, the four different region, regions here. Uh, and so if you take a look at all of the Emacs regions, you can see that there is, of course, difference between the regions, but a lot of similarities also. For all of the regions, invertebrates were the dominant biomass. Uh, and there was uh, always more benthos than zooplankton in the systems. Uh, so this is just looking at your percentage of invertebrates uh, biomass. And so, you know, George's Bank being about 25% zooplankton, uh, down to the Mid-Atlantic Bite here being about 15%. And then if you go to your, your benthos, your macro benthos, which is your, you know, smaller in faunal critters, uh, you know, same thing, you know, your 30% for George's Bank, but, uh, you know, upwards of 50 to 60% for some of these other ecoregions. And mega benthos, those are your scallops and your clams and your, and your large cancer crabs. So you can see that also makes a, a large portion of the invertebrate biomass uh, for the different regions. If you take a look at the fish communities, we see that the small pelagics constitute a large portion of the fish biomass. Uh, this was part of this was the time period when they um, parameterized the models was a time of high uh, pelagic fish biomass. So uh, it'd be interesting to see moving forward if, if these stats hold the same. Uh, but I mean, you can 
right off the bat that almost each one of these regions is above 50% of their fish biomasses in the small pelagics. Uh, you know, with the mersels making up another large chunk, and then of course your top predators mean a much smaller, you know, orders of magnitude smaller portion of the biomass, and of course your larval and juvenile fish, rightfully so, making up a, a relatively small portion of the fish population. Uh, some production ratio uh, metrics you can look at. So there's a high zooplankton to primary production ratio, uh, which of course is indicative of highly efficient trophic transfers. Uh, so things are, are moving quickly from the primary production to zooplankton and up into the rest of the food web. Uh, the ratios for benthos, uh, the ratios are lower for benthos, which is typical, of course, uh, for your larger animals as you sort of have that trophic uh, efficiency uh, moving up the food web. Um, and uh, one of the things you can do sort of as you, as you move forward, there's sort of a rule of thumb that you could take a look at this, um, these ratios of you know, small pelagics to your primary productors, primary production or demersals or whatever, and sort of the significant digit is a proxy for what trophic level it's in. And of course, that's following along with that sort of 10% trophic efficiency as you move up. Uh, we see that there's a major accumulation of biomass uh, in all four regions between trophic level two and three. Uh, and that's not really all that surprising, and that, of course, is where your megabenthos live. Uh, and so, especially having that microbial loop where you have all of your recycled uh, production going into your benthos. Um, so there's there's a, a big chunk that is, is there in, the, in that trophic level. Um, and of course, that benthic biomass readily stockpiles from the high primary production in the region and that tritol recycling, which I just mentioned. And in general, we see sort of <clears throat> a gradient from north to south uh, when you look at production. So uh, you have the Mid-Atlantic, and then your southern New England, Georgia's Bank, and your Gulf of Maine. So sort of going, you know, a decrease in your cumulative production as you move further north. Uh, so conclusions from that regional comparison uh, across the four ecoregions is that the region has high connected, uh, there's a large mixed trophic impact, so there's a lot of competition and predation going on between all the different nodes, uh, which of course this results in many multi-level and indirect effects uh, when you perturb the system and things that you might not uh, be able to follow or, or capture easily when, when you're looking at a single species uh, approach. Uh, the trophic transfer efficiencies were higher than expected, but of course decreased with increasing trophic level, which is something you would expect. There are similar structural complexities along the, the four ecoregions, uh, but subtle differences influence their ecosystem functions, and all the systems have that strong bottom-up uh, dynamics. So. <clears throat> Shifting gears away from sort of comparing those different regions, uh, what have we done with some of the, these models? So I'm, um, this is uh, an example actually of work that Sarah Geiches just did with the Atlantic Herring MSC using the Gulf of Maine EMAX model, uh, where we can incorporate uncertainty. And so uh, one of the things associated with uh, a given ecosystem model is, ecopath model is a pedigree, so you have an idea of uncertainty around your input parameters. And from that, you can sort of generate, uh, you know, a thousand different possible ecosystems by resampling all the different parameters. You run those forward, uh, you know, 50 years, and those that where something crashes out are considered to be no good because first law of thermodynamics, everything should persist. And now you whittle it down to a smaller uh, group of candidate ecosystem models and now you run those forward in ecosim, and you get sort of now, uh, if you take a look at the end of a simulation, you can get a, a range of uncertainty around uh, your perturbation rather than just sort of one di uh, deterministic run, which is what we see in a lot of ecopath models or ecosim models nowadays. And of course, so you can change uh, one group and then see how 
it cascades through the entire food web. So that's a, a general idea. Here's how she actually applied it, where we had she was attempting to get a 10% increase in production of Atlantic herring. Uh, so the first interesting thing was that the system had enough feedback loops in it that even by forcing 10%, you very rarely got 10% of production in the herring. Of course, sometimes you got a lot more, and then, of course, you got a lot less sometimes. Um, all the other foraging fish, forage fish tended to trend downward, uh, which, whether that's, uh, index, whether that's indicative of competition or the fact that their predators, the ground fish, all tended to trend upward. So there's obviously more prey available if there's more herring in the system and more ground fish than are eating other forage fish that don't have that bump to their productivity as well. Uh, and then also marine mammals tended to, to move up as well. Uh, and a similar type of uh, analysis where they decrease the herring biomass from 50%. So this is the herring biomass here. Um, similar thing you see, almost little or no change here actually when you take a look at the demersal fish and also a lot of the marine mammals and the, and the upper trophic levels. And that's really indicative of the system where uh, many of these species are generalists and aren't really overly reliant on one particular species. So that's an example of using the Emacs models that has been done recently. As far as the work that I've been doing is we are in the process of updating the Emacs models. One of the things that we are doing is basing it on the ecological production units that we've been developing. So we did um, a cluster analysis looking at lower trophic levels and um, hydrographic characteristics of the shelf and determined that uh, there was four EPUs, we're calling them, on the Mid-Atlantic Bight, which of course now includes some of that southern New England uh, eco-region we saw earlier, George's Bank, which is similar, uh, Gulf of Maine, but now we also have a Scotian Shelf um, EPU that is broken off. So there is some uh, some dynamics that we're seeing different between uh, the two parts of the Gulf of Maine up there. Uh, interestingly enough, this border corresponds fairly closely to the, the EEZ, which makes uh, management a little bit easier if we did decide to go to a place-based management uh, for EBFM where we could just worry about the three US, principally U.S. ecoregions and, and not worry that much about the Scotian Shelf ecoregion. Uh, one of the things we're doing is we're disaggregating significantly the Emacs model, so we're going to have a lot more individual species. Uh, all of the commercial species will be represented individually, uh, some with adult and juvenile groups where, where appropriate, and we're going to attempt to allow the biomass to flow between these regions, something that hasn't really been done with ecopath models. So one of the reasons that we're doing that is this is a proposed uh, management procedure for the New England Council that we've uh, been working with, where we would set um, a ceiling based on primary production uh, and non-targeted species considerations. You would then take the number of species you have and using technical interactions and diet information to aggregate those into management groups uh, and then provide aggregate catch level advice, which then of course would have to have some sort of uh, minim minimum floor to minimize the risk to overfishing individual species. So once again, in the beginning, you'd sort of have to have individual species. In the end, you have to have individual species. Uh, and in the middle, you would, uh, you would have them aggregated. And so you can take a look at, um, this is just one example of a way we could define trophic guilds uh, using um, some sort of cluster analysis where we can group these into you know, five or six or more trophic guilds. The nice thing about having them aggregated though is we can always, or, I'm sorry, the good thing about having them disaggregated is we can always aggregate up to whatever groups we want to test, and we can even test that in a management uh, strategy evaluation. But going from the Emacs to species levels, of course, would be much more difficult to disaggregate. Uh, 
So when we start thinking about the biomass flow between regions, of course, uh, you could have immigration and emigration from all the, the four different models. Uh, the easiest way to do that, if we now look back at the production of biomass uh, pi, is that we have this immigration term that we could um, link the models back and forth together. Um, those terms, of course, uh, would be a sum of the different uh, migrations between the, all the different regions. Uh, and of course, we could also have a migration term outside the system. One of the ways that we're going to do this is I've been developing our path, which is an R implementation of EWE. It's meant to complement and expand the open source possibilities of Ecopath Ecosum. Uh, one of the things it does is use a platform that's widely used by ecologists, uh, namely R, rather than the .NET uh, that EWE is built on. So EWE is open source, but uh, much harder to use. And of course, it utilizes the built-in statistical and graphical capabilities of R. So you, so a lot of people would export uh, results from EWE into R, do some analysis with it, and then import them back into to EWE. We sort of cut out the middleman there. Uh, so some advantages are you get greater flexibility and customization. You leverage those existing R packages. Uh, hopefully, there'll be community development where people will take certain parts that they like and add to the software. It now makes it cross-platform software, where before EWE was strictly Windows. You can now run it on Mac or Linux. And reproducibility is no longer this black box GUI where you point and click and uh, and can't really save what you did. Um, of course, that disadvantage is that you have no GUI interface, so you have to really know what you're doing, and some knowledge of R is required. There is a beta version of RPath available now on GitHub, so people can download directly and play with it and, and figure out what it is. Uh, I also recommend installing the data table package, which is what a lot of it is built on. Uh, I can flip back to the screen at the end because I see I'm running out of time, and I apologize. Um, so we took uh, two Emacs models at this point uh, just to test whether we could get the, the um, migration terms to work. So we took a look at the Mersal Pisivores. And uh, basically, having it follow its major prey, and I put in a, a temperature signal, and oh no, did I just lose my computer? Uh oh. I apologize. It looks like I've, I, uh, my computer just uh, powered out down on me. Um, anyway. <laughs> uh, what I was able to show is that you can, in fact, um, move um, biomass from one to the other uh, using that immigration term uh, and have it follow a temperature signal or a prey signal. Um, and we have also been using our path as uh, for a management strategy evaluation purposes, where you're able to stop the simulation in R go out and query um, uh, an external program like an ADMB model uh, or, you know, another surplus production model, whatever you want to do, have it feed in new uh, catch advice and have the model continue running. So making EWE for the first time really a closed-loop simulation uh, that it hasn't been used for uh, in the past. Um, and so... With that, I will take any questions, and I, I apologize that my computer died on me. Thank you, Sean. Uh, we're showing the last few slides here. Oh, okay. For everyone. Um, yeah, and I think I probably had some take-home messages on the last slide or two. Uh, and, but uh, more or less, that's what I, I wanted to show was really the innovations of our path and how to use it. And so, but I. I know I'm, I'm running short on time here, so I'll, I'll take any questions at this point. We do have a question from online. Paul is asking, he said, I'm not sure if this is the case, but for biomass transfer efficiency, are standing crop biomass and primary production being treated interchangeably? Standing crop can be a poor surrogate for production. If used, it would overestimate transfer efficiency to trophic level, such as the phytoplankton to zooplankton. If that's the case, shouldn't the vitriol pathway be included in the transfer efficiency estimate? Yeah, so I, 
I think he, he he's probably right there. I think um, the standing crop biomass is being used probably as a proxy for primary production. Um, I'd have to go back and look at the work that uh, Jason had done. Uh, I wasn't directly involved in that um, in those calculations, but um, what they probably should have done was multiply that biomass by the production of biomass to get at what the primary production itself was. Uh, but I can't recall off the top of my head if that is how they did it. And I don't see any more questions online at this time. I want to thank you so much for speaking with us today. No problem. And our next EVFM seminar will be on Wednesday, April 11th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Next month's speaker is Dr. Rustard Brainerd, who leads the Habitat and Living Marine Resources Program of the Ecosystem Sciences Division at the Pacific Islands Fishery Science Center. The presentation will be titled, Science to Support Ecosystem-Based Fisheries Management of Coral Reef Systems Across the U.S. Pacific Islands. We'll hope you join us next time. Thank you. Thank you.